Welcome to the Real Estate Syndication Show. Whether you are a seasoned investor or building a new real estate business, this is the show for you. Whitney Sewell talks to top experts in the business. Our goal is to help you master real estate syndication. And now your host, Whitney Sewell. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, our guest is Chris Pomerlew. Thanks for being on the show again, Chris. Thank you. Thanks for having me again. Appreciate it. Yeah, pleasure to have you back. Uh, and, and listener, if you haven't heard of Chris before, you should go back and listen to the show. WS 493 came out February the 26th. I would encourage you to do that just to learn more about Chris and our discussion at that time. But in case you haven't heard him there, uh, just a little about him. He practices family law, helps helps many people with marriage dissolution, child custody, and domestic violence cases, and more, is also an equity manager, uh, helping others achieve freedom with passive income by investing in real assets without having to invest their time and effort. He follows the professional motto, and I love, the, I love this quote. It's, on, it's in my email signature and has been for a long time. This is a really good one by Winston Churchill. And it says, we make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give. And I appreciate you sharing that as well, Chris. And why don't you give us a little update and let's dive into to what we're going to talk about today. Hey, thanks again for, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, things, have, things are moving along. Obviously, we're in different times. I know a lot of your, a lot of your guests are in the same boat. You've been talking about this a lot. But um, yeah, it's just, I, I, I hesitate to say this um, because a lot of people are struggling. And so it's certainly a serious issue, but there are some, silver lining or positive aspects that we can kind of apply to our lives and you know, just getting a chance to spend time with family, um, learning what is really needed and what's really not needed, whether that's in your business or just in your personal side. So I've, we've kind of taken this opportunity, not only as a business, but as a, on a personal level to kind of refocus on what we're doing and fine tune things that matter and sit back and just make plans dedicated to, based around what really matters, you know. Awesome. Well, I know from your experience and, and just your uh, just professionalism and being in business for a long time, helping others, uh, lots of people, uh, you know, we were going to talk about and discuss just ways that people can get started in this business and how, you know, a lot of people have to, thinking outside the box, maybe a little bit. I know when I was getting started in this business, it was like I had blinders on, right? You know, and I could just see single family or small multis. And, you know, I didn't have this idea of this, you know, what was out here and didn't think that I really had much to offer. Um, and, 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 but I know you are, you know, uh, are experienced in this business and I wanted us to just jump in and, and get right into it. No, oh, thanks. I mean, I think you said it best. Everyone has something to offer. I think that, um, you know, one of the things we continue to learn is that people come from different backgrounds. People have um, uh, different, different characteristics that, that help them succeed. But uh, when you combine kind of everybody and you form those partnerships, um, you can kind of succeed on a, on a, on a better level. And uh, that ranges from a lot of different things, but we, we continue to grow and we continue to help people because, um, we've, we've reached out and we've made sure that everybody's interests are aligned. And if I could give a couple examples, um, you know, something that's kind of top of mind, but maybe perhaps obvious to a lot of your listeners, but there are, there are professionals that have a good salary and a good living, a good income that are really interested in real estate, but they don't have the time to sit down and teach themselves how to do all this stuff. They need to build good partners. They need to, they need to, align themselves with somebody they trust. And, and that is their niche. That is what they do. They are a doctor. They are a banker. They are a, they own an HVAC company. They do whatever, but they, they concentrate on what they're passionate about. And then when it comes to their investment side, they partner with somebody who's good with that. Uh, that's kind of obvious, right? Having the money, giving the money to somebody and investing. I think not so obvious. And what I've heard a lot of people say at different meetups and whatnot is how do I get started? Well, you don't have to have a million dollars to go out and syndicate an apartment. You could have zero dollars and you could find yourself somehow on a GP. You could find yourself somehow a part of it, whether that's a, maybe you've managed property, right? I mean, maybe you know how to manage property, but you just don't have the funds to purchase or get into a syndication. If you can in, align your interests with a sponsor who who knows what they're doing, that is how you can get into this game. Maybe you know somebody with an off-market deal. Maybe you know family members. So I don't want to get too shotgun spray here, but um, I, the, the concept that 
oh, it's just too much to tackle right now, or it's such a large area to learn. That's what we're all here for. We all can fill a certain niche, if you will. We feel a lot of times you feel so uh, alone, right? When you're first getting started, you, you may not know many people in the business. You haven't networked much yet. And even, even that alone can seem kind of intimidating if you're going to go and try to start meeting people and networking, even that by itself. However, it's such a, a team sport. Mm -hmm. uh, I, mean, I mean, the whole, every aspect of, of the syndication business, there's going to be team members, even if they're not in this under the same uh, company name. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people you have to work with to make this happen. Uh, but I just think it's interesting. You know, you talk about uh, maybe I'm, I'm really good at managing properties. Maybe you've only had a few small multis or single family like I did, you know, when, before getting into the single or uh, syndication business. And, uh, but, you know, you have some skills there. Right, Chris? I mean, right. you learn some skills, uh, you know, from that, that you can contribute and, and help somebody. Of course. Yeah. I mean, I know that there's, there's a young investor in town here that um, super motivated, wants to learn how to do all these kind of things and had a few family members with some money that wanted to get into it. So what did that investor do? That investor, a really young, young guy, motivated. He used the money of his family members who wanted some good returns to then invest into with another sponsor or a couple other sponsors. And he got a part of that GP because of how much money he brought. He didn't know a thing about syndication. So these are opportunities for people to learn those things. Now through this process, he'll learn what GPs do. He'll learn what it takes to be on that side. And there's no doubt in my mind, he'll be good at it because he's motivated, but that's a prime example. He did, he had $0 to start. So yeah, it's just about being passionate and seeing where you can fit in. I love hearing stories like that too, because I think it is a uh, mis misconception that er er a lot of people feel like, well, I've got to have so much to, to get in or I, and you know, I can't, I can't say it's just absolutely free, you know, even going to a networking event, if you're traveling somewhere it may cost a little bit, you know, right. uh, but, but, you know, as far as, you know, like you said, you don't have to have millions, you don't have to have hundreds of thousands then mm -hmm. um, you can still make something happen. Um, any, any other examples of you uh, you've seen it? It doesn't even have to be in syndication, but, but, you know, where somebody has, has really coming up from, from nothing to, uh, to make it happen, you know, in, in that yeah. industry that they were looking for. I mean, this is still in the investment arena, but I mean, being an agent, I think agents, way too many agents are taking advantage of their platform. Um, not only are they part of most deals, but if they can hold off, I, I understand that's their livelihood, but if they could perhaps not pocket 100% of their commission and they can roll some of that into a project, that's a good way to perhaps then continue learning on that project. Maybe they're just an LP on that deal but they're learning the system instead of just closing the deal and then walking away. And that's a prime example. I think agents have a great platform to take advantage of. Um, you know, I have a family member who very smart guy deals with a lot of constructions. He actually builds apartments. Didn't know anything about investments, uh, but he has so much to offer when it comes to the construction side of things and looking at estimates and keeping with the contractors and he's motivated to learn. And so he's, he's, volunteering his time he's not getting paid for it to give his skill towards an investment that he's a part of while also learning the investment as a whole and that's a prime example of, of an opportunity that it, i hate to give the the money or knowledge uh, example because even though those are important there are times where you may not know anybody you may not have any money you may not have or feel you though you have a skill i apologize you might feel as though you have a skill to offer but you can talk to people, just talking to people, knocking on the door of a leasing office and seeing what, a, what it looks like and see if you can talk to the owner and see if you can interest an owner in selling is something any of us could do. Some of us would be good, some of us would be bad, but that took no money and it took no actual labor skills or knowledge necessarily, just some people skills. So those are some examples that I've actually seen work and you know, as we continue to grow, it's because of the partnerships and the teams we're building. It's because we're finding people like that and they're finding us too. Uh, we're all fitting in and helping build the team and helping get to the, the end goal. And it's, it's working for everybody. So it's great. I, I thought that was a good example there. Even just going to the management company or going somewhere like that and just asking questions. I guarantee you are going to learn a lot. You will. You will. <laughs> You're you, going to you, learn uh, a lot. Uh, certainly. Certainly.
So, you know, but that, that's a great segue right into, you know, actually finding a partner or what, you know, what you look for in a partner and, and what that should look like. And, and I have heard different ways that, you know, people have said, well, this is what I want in a partner or what I want in a partner. Or this is what, you know, uh, is, is a must, you know, for me or for them or whatever. But, you know, what, what do you suggest? And I, I know you're an attorney as well, but I know you, you do yeah. family law, but still, um, I think partnerships affect families <laughs> in a big way. Uh, <laughs> you know, a business partnerships, I mean, you know, that still affects families in a big way. Um, and I can only imagine some of the stories and stuff you have to deal with. But, you know, but that gives a good background for you to think about, you know, ways that maybe that, that failed, you know, in different partnerships. And, and uh, uh, but so for you, Chris, you know, help us think about through that a little bit, as far as finding that right partner. Uh, I know even just getting started too, a lot of times it's great if you can find a more experienced partner, right. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody that, especially uh, other types of skills. Um, but, but sometimes it's, it's like two people that are br both brand new that are partnering, you know, as well, and they still make it work. Uh, right. But what, what suggestions do you have? Well, I mean, look, everybody started somewhere, right? So you can look at the most successful syndicator and they had a first deal. So if they can right. do it, you can do it. We can all do it. So it, I've never really liked the, the approach of experience. Now I'm able to stand behind my experience as something that people respect. And I, and I, and I like that, but there was a time where I first started. So um, I think the important thing you need to find in a partner, no question is transparency. Uh, right now is a, a perfect time. If you're an LP on a deal and, and you've, if, you've, if, if somebody's reached out to you and told you nothing's going to happen, this is no big deal, we haven't really put any plans in place because it is what it is and it's all blown up, of course, or whatever. And I'm not even getting political here, but that's not necessarily a realistic outlook. And, and I'm not trying to say that anybody's doing anything wrong there, but honesty and transparency is huge in who you find as a partner. Um, it, you know, if we're looking at what we're going to find for rents in April or rents in May here, we need to have a plan in place and we need to prepare our investors that this may not, you know, our original projections may be put on hold for a little bit. That, that five, 6% bump we expected on rents, that might be changed here because people are worried about making the original rent pays. And those are honest conversations you have to have. I can tell you this much though, them paying their rent is still doing a lot better than the stock market right now. But right. Regardless, I think it's important that you find a partner that you can trust and it's going to be open with you up front. This is only my fourth deal, they might tell you, instead of, uh, instead of trying to blow out proportions if they've been doing it for 20 years. Or if something bad happens, they'll, they'll be the first one to tell you about that. I think that um, vetting who you're going to be with, asking those hard questions, you're, you're about to give them a lot of money or you're about to give them a lot of time. You know, if you're going to be a property manager for somebody, just because you can get into a deal, maybe even on the GP side, and somehow get your foot in the door. You don't want to get your foot in the wrong door, right? Even, even sure. if you're not putting any money up, right? Exactly, right. Because now, what's that saying? You mess up your first syndication, you, you might be done forever, right? And you don't want to be known as somebody who was on that syndication that tanked. Um, sure, you didn't lose any money, but you might have lost your respect, or you might have lost your name, or you might have lost even a taste for, for the investment opportunity, which things will happen. Uh, but you can help mitigate those risks by making sure you find the right partners. And I think you need to ask some questions with, of those partners before you, before you decide to, uh, to go down the investment route with them. No doubt about it. It's such, uh, it, I mean, it's just like a marriage. I feel like. Yeah, exactly. Uh, right. Uh, and unfortunately too many of those end, end up be <laughs> end really badly. It uh, is my job, uh, which is also unfortunate as well. But um, you know, you're right. It's just like a marriage. You know, it, 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 it can be more difficult and obviously transparency and honesty are huge in a marriage, transparency and huge in a partnership. So no, you're right. And, and even through the divorce process, actually, whether it's the attorneys being honest with each other or whether it's the parties being honest with each other, I have seen, you know, divorces aren't positive, but I have seen them come to a relatively amicable and streamlined process, uh, end if everyone can just be honest up front set reasonable expectations and, and that helps guide the entire trajectory of the, of the case, if you will. And that's the same for an investment. If you're setting expectations to get 20% cash on cash within the first year, even if you in your heart of hearts believe that if something like this happens, you need to be honest with your investors up front. So um, 
Yeah, no, I agree with you. Marriages, investments, I guess life in general, you should probably just be an honest person. That's right. And communicate well. <laughs> right. That's right. No, you're right. Yeah. Are there any questions that, that you see that are very important when you're just vetting that potential partner or you know, business partner? Um, you know, anything that uh, you say, I, I, I really want to know this, or I mean, like, this is a must, I have to know these things or anything specifically, you know, about this individual. Say we just met at a conference, you know, six months ago, uh, and we've just got to know each other a little bit. You know, anything that, that you say, okay, you know, these are some things from maybe their background, their history, whatever that I have to know. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I think that one of the most important things to look at are how would this sponsor or partner handle uh, a situation that doesn't necessarily go correctly? Like perhaps ask them, give me an example of, of an investment you've had that did not turn out the way you thought it would. Uh, I can tell you in a month from now, or maybe even a few weeks from now, you can ask that sponsor, how did you handle this COVID-19 issue? How did your property management approach this? How did you approach your investors? Uh, seeing how people come come out of this is going to be huge. And I and I know that you know this. Talking to you've talked to so many investors, but a lot of the successful ones who've been doing this for a long time got so much better because they were able to build their strong foundation through the last recession. And the ones that come out of this uh, strong and still helping being able to help their investors is they're the ones who are really going to succeed. So I think a good question to ask a sponsor is, look, what are you doing right now in the middle of this? Uh, if you don't want to make it related to the COVID-19 thing, you just simply say, give me an example of some, you know, you planned on selling in five years, it didn't work. What was your backup plan? What was your second route exit strategy? What happened with that? Because things will change. If things happen, um, sometimes for the better, sometimes not as good as, as expected. So seeing how they handle that's huge. I think it's a really important thing to ask uh, future partners for sure. Yeah, it's, it's so important. I know before uh, I formed a partnership with someone else, I, I mean, I'd been asked many times by lots of people to partner and, and turn them down. And sometimes I felt like, like it was almost the first conversation I'd ever had with this person. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, what, you know, yeah. like that just doesn't make sense, <laughs> you know? Uh, I, and sometimes it wasn't, but I just didn't feel it was a good fit, you know, right. personally or, or, or just our skill sets. Uh, but uh, what would you say as far as skill sets? I know we talked a little bit about getting started and how if we're a property, maybe we have some property management skills, uh, right. but even on a deeper level or, you know, as far as um, underwriting or asset management or maybe marketing or uh, anything like that, as far as, um, uh, you know, just complementary skill sets, way you've seen it work really well together? Well, I, you know, I think one of the, one of the examples that I gave earlier was that having access to money and then learning the process through that. And this is an individual that didn't even have, which by the way, I, I know more than this one, this one individual that does this, but this individual didn't have the nine to five giving the six figure income that then he could give to a sponsor and then learn the process. This individual didn't have a job, knew people with money, and then was able to help them on investing, but then connect them with a sponsor and then learn the process. And so you don't even need to actually be the person making the money. Um, if you are the one that has money you want to invest, I think it's good to diversify. Obviously right now, I said earlier, I, I'd much rather be in real estate right now than any other asset class. But I think you, you look at that and you say, I'd like to learn this, or maybe I don't have time to learn it. And I just want someone who can do it for me. Um, but if you're still wanting to learn how to do it, picking, giving that money into somebody is a, an opportunity to learn that process. I think we, we spoke about it last time on, that I was on your show, but finding a coach too, you know, that coach, that mentor, someone you can speak with that's going to help you. There are so many doubts in our minds, right? And you might say, I'm a young person. I don't have a job or I have a full-time job. I don't have time to do this or I'll never be able to do this. That mentor, that coach helps you kind of dive into that. First off, figure out why you're thinking that way and then kind of develop new ways to look at it and, and think outside of the box. And I think continuing that relationship through a mentor is a great way to get started in this business, actually. Mm, for sure. Uh, I couldn't agree more, uh, Chris. And, and uh, yeah, we all, we all need mentors. Anybody that's successful has probably numerous mentors. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, and, you know, I probably asked you last time you were on the show, I probably asked you, you know, how you were preparing for a potential downturn. You know, so, you know, in, in your you real did. estate business, you did. and and, uh, you did. <laughs> and so you know, I, I'd like to ask now, you know, you know how that's how that's worked, how that's yeah. how, you know how uh, what you were doing, let's say, 
you know, two or three months ago, six months ago, we're helping you prepare for, you know, what's happened now. Right. Well, I'm glad to hear you say that because um, we were very prepared. Uh, we didn't expect anything like this. And it's not, you know, a global pandemic isn't typically on somebody's pro forma uh, and their due diligence and their underwriting. But um, I think the same concepts I probably talked to you about the last one I showed our business approach was that you want to ha- try to find debt that's fixed as long as possible. Uh, if possible, find, make it non-recourse, have a number of years built in that's interest only or something that where you, gives you time to reposition the property and make sure cash flows right away. That's something we've always done. And you don't have to do that. Plenty of people are buying distressed properties, but I couldn't imagine closing on a large complex in January thinking I could raise $100 a unit and then cash flow. And then finding out now that not only can I not raise rent, but, but I, I'm getting 50% of my renters paying. So it's nice to hear you ask that question again, because even though pandemic wasn't on my radar, it hasn't affected us. Are we taking the necessary steps by speaking with lenders and speaking with investors and making sure we're in the best place possible? No question. Are we frantically looking everywhere to save ourselves? No, because we put ourselves in a position where we are relatively safe. And so the answer, the long, long answer to your question is that make sure your debt is relatively safe for you. And I would say looking forward and sellers have to understand this now, I'd say looking forward, this is a buyer's market when it comes to terms. This is my opinion right now. I've already seen it come to fruition and the contracts we're getting right now. Um, sellers aren't going to get most likely what they thought they were going to get eight weeks ago. And if they're going to get the same price, they're certainly not going to get the same terms. There's a number of flexibility items that you have on your side as a buyer. Uh, case in point, we have a contract for a larger apartment right now that uh, the close is 120 days from now with, an ex- with the ability to extend 30 days and the due diligence period of 90 days. That would have been scoffed at a month ago. But now we have to protect ourselves. There's another clause we put in there that we want to make sure that uh, within the last 30 days of closing, there's a 90% ocu- economic occupancy. So not just occupy, but actually being paid. Now there are some lenders like Freddie Mac who are going to make that mandatory or at least deal with a load of waivers anyway. But um, those are ways to protect yourself moving forward, not only get the right debts, but also make sure the contract is written so that you're protected so you have the opportunity to get out in the end if things unfortunately get worse, which hopefully they do not. But we're in the driver's seat if we can draft the contract the way we want to. And sellers know that now. They truthfully know that now. They are kicking themselves for not selling six months ago. Right. I'm kicking myself. Not <laughs> what about the uh, earnest money is how, you know, how you all are handling earnest low, money. Has that changed? Low. I'm, I'm, I'm making it low. I'm not going to put a large amount of my earnest to sit there in a, in an account, not earning anything. If cash was ever trash or if cash was ever dead, it's certainly dead. Now we have no idea what's going to happen with, you know, the stimulus and the actual value of the dollar and, if we end up having to not move forward on the contract 94 days from now, but I had 80,000 sitting in in an account um, with title, that doesn't really help us. So sellers are beginning to become okay with this. You know, just in the last month and a half, um, which I understand things have gotten quickly worse, but we've seen our ability to either retrade just on the negotiation uh, side of of a lower EMD and a longer drawn out closing. And if they don't like that, that's fine, but I don't want to be that investor. And I certainly don't want to be that sponsor right. who put in a hundred and hundred fifty thousand dollars uh, and then not be able to close. And maybe some of your investors money is sitting there, not getting any interest, not getting any returns. And so that's a way to protect yourself. Tell me about a little bit of the investor um, outlook or environment that you're feeling right now from conversations you've had with your investors? Are, there, are, are they, you know, ready to invest now because they feel like the market has gone so far down and they want to ride it back up or, or are they scared? It's a mix and it kind of depends upon their knowledge of the, of the class, right? So I can tell you our investors who have traditionally relied heavily on the market are pretty happy to start looking elsewhere. Um, it's taken such a nosedive. Um, I would never take this opportunity to say, I told you so, but 
that's the problem with the market. Um, the, the lack of uh, liquidity in real estate actually comes out to be a benefit for all of us because we can't react uh, in an unnatural and an unreasonable way. You know, you see your stocks going down and you try to cash them out the next day. And that's what happens. There's a frenzy and people just start unloading their assets. Well, you can't do that in real estate. And that's actually probably a good thing. There's also a number of other reasons why I feel it's better. But um, I think that investors that are seeing what the market's done to their, to their portfolio is they're certainly a lot more interested in starting to restructure the pie chart of their investments, if you will. I think that other investors we have that have somewhat of a decent knowledge in the real estate area already are salivating. I mean, they're, they, they're, they're hoping that 30 days from now, everyone's healthy, but they're also hoping that 30 days from now, it's one of the best buyer's markets we've ever seen because people who didn't put the long-term debt into place, people who weren't prepared for this are having to offload their prop properties. So those investors are pretty excited. Um, and then of course, I, the other third part of that, I'd say I had some people who just simply don't want to do anything because they're a little worried of what's going to happen. Um, sure. And with things changing every five minutes on the news and depending on who you talk to, I don't, I don't necessarily blame them, but I just don't want to be the person who a year from now say, I didn't do anything for a year because I was scared. Because I think there's always opportunity uh, to, to make the best of the situation, I guess. I love that mindset of just seeing opportunity, being ready to see opportunity. Right. You know, if, if you're already just mentally closed off to thinking it's a, you know, it's just horrible times and nothing great right now, then you're going to miss the opportunity. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Chris, uh, tell us, before we have to go, tell us how you like to give back. Well, I mean, now we're doing a lot. Uh, one of the things we've done through a number of our property management groups is ask the tenants how we can actually help. Um, you know, we're successful, but it doesn't mean we can just for the next six months pay the rent for all of our hundreds of tenants. It's not how that's going to work. But these are real people and we, we provide them a place to live. So reaching out to the tenants as part of a somewhat of a template email that they should get from their property management anyway about the number of ways they can pay, there should be more than one option. We should be a little more understanding here, not only because they're going, the tenants are going through a hard time, we need the money to pay our mortgage as well. We have to understand that. But outside of the financial pieces to give links and give access to uh, support systems, whether it's through the state, whether it's the state assistance, whether it's food drives, um, one of my property management companies went and purchased uh, gift cards um, for, and they, they okayed this through us first. They purchased gift cards uh, for local restaurants that could then be used at local restaurants for food. Well, that helps two people. And to be honest, it helps three people. It helps us because the, the tenants are becoming more happy. Uh, now they have something to help them with food and it's helping the local establishments as well. So that's something they okayed through us. And that's I, financially, that's how we're giving back. We all need to get through it together. We need to be understanding on both sides, but this is a real serious situation. It's a little different than 08, 09. So keeping that in mind is, is what we've liked to do and let them know, look, yes, rent is due. We'll figure it all out, but here are some ways you can help your family through it. And that's been honestly, um, it's been very rewarding. Unfortunately, it's having to happen, but I'm happy we're in a position where we can help them. Love that. I appreciate you sharing that and, and, and how you all are handling that. I think it's incredible just to be able to reach out like that and say, how, you know, how can we help? What's the needs? But it goes right back to, to your motto in your bio. And, you know, we, we make a living by, by what we get. Uh, but yeah, by what we do. We, yeah, we make a living by what we get. Uh, we make a life by what we give. Right. Uh, yeah. And how you all are giving back in that way. I appreciate that. And but tell the listeners how they can get in touch with you and learn more about you. Yeah, so I'm Chris. Uh, my email is at chris at parkavinvesting.com. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, we also have a special report, some things you need to look at as an investment partner that you want to ask somebody you want to invest with, things you need to ask these questions for. You can find that at partneringchecklist.com. Um, this is a special report we like to offer people. Just read it. Make sure you understand what you're getting into and kind of review those type of things. Those are things that are really important to anybody, whether you're going to move forward in a syndication or whether you're going to hire someone to mow your lawn. I think it's important to, to, to know exactly what they're offering, how they're going to handle things. And so I'd like to draw attention to that, that website. Don't be afraid to, to hit me up on email or LinkedIn and I'm always happy to, to help.
And tell us one more time where we found that link uh, to find that report. Yes, partneringchecklist.com. Thank you for listening to the Real Estate Syndication Show, brought to you by LifeBridge Capital. LifeBridge Capital works with investors nationwide to invest in real estate, while also donating 50% of its profits to assist parents who are committing to adoption. LifeBridge Capital, making a difference, one investor and one child at a time. Connect online at www.lifebridgecapital.com for free material and videos to further your success.